And so we have 1 to 8 is um, Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and then eventually to uh, the ends of the earth. And this is, of course, what we're told is going to happen by Christ and by Luke at the end of his first book, at the end of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24. <clears throat> Those of you who are members of Ohachi know that I've been struggling vocally lately. Struggled through the sermon yesterday. Still am a little bit. <clears throat> Luke 24, 44. Then he said to him, this is Jesus speaking his last words to the apostles. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. That is in the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Specifically, since there was no New Testament at this point, he opened their minds to see the same things those in the road to Emmaus saw in the previous paragraphs, that Christ was the fulfillment of all things in the Old Testament. He opened their eyes to see Christ in the scriptures. Um, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it's written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, verse 47, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are witnesses. Here's that word again. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of the Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power on high. So Luke sets that up in his first letter. He says <clears throat> that you are going to be my witnesses to the whole earth, to all nations, not just to the Jews, but to all nations. This is a paradigm-shifting thing, right, which is a big theme throughout the rest of the New Testament and a theme in the Old Testament as well, though the Jews didn't see it. They're going to be the witnesses to all nations, starting in Jerusalem and then moving outward. Uh, they're going to be his witnesses. And that's, that is what we see in the book of Acts. He says in Acts 1.8, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And that's precisely what we see in the book of Acts. Now, of that word witnesses, one of the things I think is significant to say is um, <clears throat> I've, th there are many that make the application far too direct for the Christians, saying the Christians should be doing Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And, and in principle... The church is charged with the Great Commission um, to, to continue in principle the Great Commission of the end of Luke there, Matthew 28, uh, Mark 16, in the same way the apostles did. But we're not charged to do it in the same way the apostles did. That is, we're not commanded to do it individually the way the apostles were commanded to do it. They were special. They were different. And the thing that was different about the apostles, many things. One of the primary things, probably the primary thing that was different about the apostles than me and you is that they were actually eyewitnesses of Christ. They were eyewitnesses of what had, had happened, and so they were going to be his eyewitnesses to the world. Right? Uh, cr Christianity has never been a just blind hope that I'm telling you the truth, just trust, just take the leap of faith, sort of. It's, it's always been a, here's why you should believe, even to the point of Christ giving us, God giving us eyewitnesses from the very beginning. And, and there, there obviously cannot be eyewitnesses in the same way that there were in the first century. That's why there cannot really be apostles in the way there were in the first century. And, and I'm trying to make that clear for you. Um, in Acts chapter 1, again, verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the ends of the earth. It says that to the apostles. And then, chapter 1, verse 21, later, as they're, as they're um, assigning a twelfth apostle to replace Judas, it says... Uh, they say in verse 21, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Do you hear the criteria to be an apostle? The criteria was you had to be an eyewitness of everything Christ did along with the apostles from the baptism of John until his ascension, his resurrection and ascension, to be a witness with them of the resurrection. Nobody can do that anymore. In fact, not everybody at the first century could do that. That's why they were spelling out this criteria, because the one that was going to fill that role of the 12th apostle had to be one that had witnessed everything, because he had to be an eyewitness on the same level as the apostles were eyewitnesses. So that's the idea that there can't be apostles, at least in the same sense that there were apostles in the first century, just as in the sense that the word apostle means messenger, of course, we're all apostles in some sense, but we're not apostles like they were apostles because they were eyewitnesses to everything Christ did and to his ascension, to his resurrection. And they went out into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to be those eyewitnesses, to say, let me tell you what I saw with my own eyes. Let me saw, and, and it's one of the great proofs of Christianity that those men were all, uh, well, no, we don't know how many of them were. It, uh, tradition says 11 of the 12 were tortured and martyred. We know for sure Three or four of them were, and, and in all likelihood, uh, uh, at least a couple more were. 
Sean McDowell wrote a great book on that, his dissertation on that topic of, of the fate of the apostles, um, which is worth the time if you're interested in that kind of thing. It's kind of academic, but it's good. Um, saying basically too often we overstate the case and say 11 of the 12 were martyred, which they may have been. We, we don't know that historically uh, or biblically, but we do know that a few were. Um, anyway, but they all were willing to be martyred for their faith, and it's one of the great proofs of Christianity that they were all willing in the culture where they were being persecuted, being tortured, being martyred, being ostracized for preaching the resurrection, that they all were still doing it, that they were all really convinced about what they believed. They actually did believe that Christ rose from the dead, one of the great truths, one of Gary Habermas's minimal facts that virtually all scholars agree upon is that disciples really believed that he rose from the dead because their actions that followed that simply can't make sense otherwise, can't be made sense of otherwise. Um, and so these eyewitnesses to Christ's life, death, and resurrection, the apostles, go out into Jerusalem to say, here's what we saw, to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, to say, here's what we saw, in a way that nobody has been able to since because we weren't simply eyewitnesses. 